Welcome to No Apologies. I'm Dana Lash. Let's say that you are a diabolical villain and you wanted to increase crime in America. How would you go about doing it? Well, first, you would relax laws like Democrats did in San Francisco, so it's no longer a felony to steal things that cost less than $950. And if you did that, crimes like this would happen all the time. This is a video from a San Francisco Walgreens just last week. If you wanted to really up crime levels, you would let people do meth in public and pitch a tent on the boardwalk in places like Venice Beach, California. Then you'd look the other way as drug dealers moved in to feed these meth addicts habits. Next thing you know, you'd have homeless encampments where violence breaks out daily, like this. If you wanted more crime, you would turn criminals into saints like a man who resists arrest for 20 minutes. There was enough fentanyl in his system to kill a horse, according to an autopsy report. And yes, he's a career criminal who once stuck, like, stuck a pistol to a pregnant woman's belly. You would pray to him like Nancy Pelosi did, treating him like a saint. You wouldn't wait for justice to play out when that criminal dies at the hands of a Minneapolis cop. No, instead, if you were a diabolical villain, you would immediately empower every Marxist organization like BLM who condemned every single law enforcement as being as bad as Derek Chauvin and racist in America because of one incident. And you then would capitulate to demands that you defund the police and you would not condemn any outrageous ideas coming from inside your own party by people like AOC or Ilhan Omar. Instead, you would ignore them. And when riots would break out all across the country in which store owners were beaten in the street and police were run over and attacked in broad daylight, you'd simply say that this was just the plight of the unheard. People were just getting bread. Remember that one? No justice, no peace, right? And if you really wanted to juice up the crime numbers, when you notice that these so-called protesters seem to care less about George Floyd and any actual real injustice and more about looting Nikes and stereos because you're a diabolical villain, you would then call this looting reparations and you would talk about how it really doesn't matter when people burn down and loot businesses because after all, those businesses are insured. And most of them are minority owned in the areas in which they were burned down. And if you weren't happy yet with how much crime that you had produced so far, you could always look the other way as groups like Antifa rioted nightly for over a year straight in Democrat run Portland, attempting to burn down businesses and federal courthouses literally executing one person in the street in cold blood. In city after city, you would simply let criminals know that there would be almost no penalty, if any at all, for doing all of the above. So that's right, riot, loot, attack police, and burn down your neighborhood. And then, heck, Vice President Kamala Harris herself will call you a protester and encourage people to bail you out. And to make sure violent crime continues to rise, you'd let police know across America that you don't have their backs. You have the criminals' backs, and you would catch and release these violent criminals over and over and over and over and over again so they could be repeat offenders. Because just for the record, in places like Chicago, most violent crime is perpetrated by repeat offenders. It's the same criminals committing crime after violent crime. In fact, it's the same 1,400 criminals that contribute to over 86% of the city's crime rate, according to the former superintendent of Chicago police. Yeah, if you were diabolical, you'd arrest them and then the Democrat policies and laws put them right back on the street, right? And this has the effect of demoralizing the, the police completely while also emboldening criminals. And if you did all of these things, you would cause violent crime to spike massively in America. And that's exactly what has happened. But all of this was brought to you not by a diabolical villain, but from like somebody from a Bond movie, but instead from an absolutely corrupt group of people called the Democrat Party. See, the fact is the massive spikes in crime in America are concentrated in blue states and in big cities, 100% run by Democrats, more on that in a minute. There's literally no one else to whom we can lay the blame because it's only Democrats that hold power in these types of cities. See, it's important to understand something else. This explosion of violent crime in big cities all happened very specifically because of these Democrat policies. And how do we know that? Because crime was actually dropping all across the country before all of this. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason why you didn't see home burglaries, and there's a reason why you saw fewer of those, actually, and fewer other types of crime because of the pandemic, because people were less mobile. Crimes like rapes, home burglaries fell, drug crimes even, well, for some, dropped off. But according to a study by citycrimestats.com, and this was published by Marketplace, I believe, over at Bloomberg, overall crime fell by 23% in the first month of the coronavirus lockdown. But the study also notes something else that's telling. The drop in overall crime rates masks the rise 
in the rate of some violent crime beginning in the summer of 2020. In certain cities too, gee, I wonder what happened at the beginning of the summer in 2020. You know what happened, of course. You had George Floyd's death and Democrats' morally bankrupt response to all of it that I was just discussing with you. So after all of this, if you were a diabolical villain or maybe just a Democrat politician, what would you do when you realized law-abiding Americans were outraged by all of this unnecessary violent crime and they were beginning to connect the lawlessness to you and your terrible policies? Well, you would do what any villain would do or a Marxist Democrat. You change the subject. That's exactly what the Biden administration is doing now. See, rather than blame their horrible governance of these cities or condemn BLM or Antifa or put radical elements of their party like the squad in a timeout since they're petulant kindergartners, no, instead, what do they do? Easy. Do what they always do. Distract everyone and blame guns. Watch. And I might add, the Second Amendment from the day it was passed limited the type of people who could own a gun and what type of weapon you could own. You couldn't buy a cannon. Those who say the blood of the the blood of patriots, you know, and all the stuff about how we're going to have to move against the government. Well, the tree of liberty is not water with the blood of patriots. What's happened is that there have never been. If you wanted to think you need to have weapons to take on the government, you need F-15s and maybe some nuclear weapons. The point is that there's always been the ability to limit, rationally limit the type of weapon that can be owned and who can own it. Exactly what you would expect from Democrats, creating the problem and then proposing a solution that fits the agenda. But it doesn't address the actual problem because Democrats just, it's not that they hate guns, they like guns for them, they hate guns for you. It's they hate that you own them. And they know that cracking down on guns will play well with their base, even though their own base doesn't list it as a top five priority, not even in the last election. In 2019, now here's something else. You know, I told you we were going to talk about this in a minute. The Washington Post published data detailing the cities in America with the most violent crime rates. And the cities with the overall highest crime rates were New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, Philadelphia, Memphis, Detroit, Dallas, Phoenix, Baltimore, San Antonio, Las Vegas, Milwaukee, Nashville, Charlotte, Albuquerque, Jacksonville, Florida, St. Louis, San Francisco, and Cleveland. What do all of these cities have in common? Democrat mayors and city councils, with the exception of San Antonio and Las Vegas, which elected independent mayors, and Jacksonville, which elected a Republican mayor, each of those cities listed are run by Democrats. Now, the most violent cities in America, and this is, again, Washington Post, per 10,000 residents, Memphis, St. Louis, Detroit, Baltimore, Springfield, Missouri, Little Rock, Stockton, California, Cleveland, San Bernardino, Oakland, New Orleans, Albuquerque, South Bend, Indiana, Milwaukee, Rockford, Illinois, Lansing, North Las Vegas, Wichita, Chattanooga, and Houston. All with the exception of Springfield, Missouri. All of them have a Democrat mayor. And not just Democrat mayors, but gun control mayors with city councils to match. These are also the cities with some of the lowest prosecution rates for felony crimes committed with illegally possessed firearms. For example, in December of 2013, Chicago media reported how thousands of felony gun cases were dismissed in Cook County criminal courts. In April of 2021, according to CWV Chicago, a felon rearrested for the murder of a rival gang member. Well, he was arrested and it was able to commit this murder because he had been allowed to walk for just a $200 bond on a felony gun charge that usually sees an exponentially higher penalty. And by exponentially higher, I mean you're looking at five figures and at least a minimum of 10 years in jail. These are not exceptions to the rule. They are the rule. Criminals thrive on the indulgence of the court's coddling as justice is denied to their victims. This routinely happens in these cities on this list. Democrats don't address this in Biden's gun control plan. In fact, this gun control plan isn't even serious about reducing crime at all whatsoever. The gun control plan doesn't include anything about, I don't know, something like recreating Project Exile, which was under former AG, under former President Trump, Jeff Sessions. This was about holding these repeat offenders to minimum mandatory in federal courts, going after those felony charges for illegal possession of firearms often carried in commission of other felonious activity. 
No, there's nothing in there about that. Nothing in there about increasing prosecution rates. Nothing in there even about going after fraudulently filled out 4473s, which, by the way, Joe Biden had told a bunch of people, including reporters, on a conference call about seven years ago that, quote, the government just doesn't have time to go and prosecute everyone who lies on a 4473, end quote. Google it. No, they're not, in, they're not interested in any of that. They're not interested in improving police morale or even providing discretionary training or de-escalation training for police or any kind of anything that is going to help improve the relationship between minority communities and police or just communities in general and police. Nothing in there at all whatsoever. Nothing in there that actually accomplishes anything that they say they want to accomplish. And that's, the, that's why this is a scam. Oh, but they do want to refund the police, which is amazing to me. No, this is all about your rights. This whole thing is this, it's an old canard that allows them to distract from the real problem, their own failed policies. And it's also important to point out that Biden kind of made a deal with the devil here. He and Democrats have allowed the radical elements to seize control of their party from the inside out. Groups like the Antifa and BLM and, you know, all the other stuff. For all intents and purposes, BLM... That is the Democrat Party. Their rhetoric is the Democrat Party's rhetoric. And city after city, defund the police, reimagine the police, looting, are, that's reparations. Police are, are, are systemically racist. Now the president is in a real bind. The energy in his party comes from these radical neo-racists who really don't like America and condemn them as he should and he'll lose their support and their power. But he's got to put some distance between everything that they've done this past summer and now, because I can only imagine those internal polls are who boy. So there's only one thing he can do, change the subject, blame guns, and talk endlessly about white supremacy. Biden's plan supposedly has a zero tolerance, pol zero tolerance policy. I've read it, and if you want to read my fisking of it, you should sign up to my newsletter, chapter and verse. No, they want to go after, quote unquote, rogue gun dealers accused of violating rules. Sidebar. Is that go for the Fast and Furious gun dealers that they forced under ATF and the previous gun walking operation, Fast and Furious, under Obama Biden during the first term when they actually ended up finding out that all of these firearms that they were forcing these gun sellers to sell to cartels ended up using, being used in crimes, killing Mexican nationals, killing border agents. In fact, El Chapo himself had a 50 cal from Fast and Furious in his possession at the time of arrest. True story. No, the administration wants to blame national crime waves on firearms but legally owned firearms by innocent Americans. The problem isn't rogue gun dealers. The problem's criminals, as I was explaining. The fact is, we already have thousands of laws about firearms and firearm sales. I mean, the whole, the whole thing about ghost guns, that's a whole joke. You have, the, you have the Undetectable Firearms Act of 1988. That's older than some of you watching this. You can't make undetectable firearms and sell them. It is already federally regulated, so it's already illegal. Are you gonna make it illegaler? The real issue, is when there is a violation of a gun sale law, it is almost never enforced. When it, these violations are not enforced, you can make all the laws in the world that you want to. But if you're not going to enforce them, and Democrats clearly refuse to enforce them, the president himself is on the record saying that he's not going to enforce them. What is the point of another law? Instead of a zero tolerance policy for rogue gun dealers, how about a zero tolerance policy for violent criminals, repeat offenders? Biden's new plan also allows states to raid the coronavirus relief bill for money to hire more police, right? To refund police, <laughs> for heaven's sakes. Biden doesn't condemn cries to defund the police from his own party, so police are then demoralized and they quit, and now they want to refund the police with coronavirus stimulus cash. That is what, that's what getting swindled looks like. That's what chaos looks like. This is an inept presidency presiding over a Marxist party who promotes crime and gives aid and comfort to criminals. And the Biden administration's answer to all of this is go after guns and gun dealers, of course, which is foolish and won't work because it's never worked. You don't need guns to loot right and burn down neighborhoods. You don't need a gun to brutally beat Asian Americans in the street as we've been seeing in major cities. Democrats are in deep trouble as a party. And by the way, I wish that they cared about mass casualty incidents when they occurred in other places besides white bread communities. No, they're not serious about dealing with the rising crime that their policies have caused. And this useless new policy, blaming guns and gun dealers from the Biden administration, shows you that they know it. Up next, we take a deep dive into Biden's new gun crime strategy with National Shooting Sports Foundation's Matt Manda. Keep it here.
Black Rifle Coffee Company is a veteran-owned coffee company serving premium coffee to people who love America. Veteran CEO and founder Evan Hafer spent over seven years on the ground overseas with U.S. Special Forces and as a CIA contractor. Black Rifle Coffee is committed to Evan's mission of supporting veteran, law enforcement, and first responder causes. So this summer, Black Rifle Coffee Company invites you to enjoy your coffee. Whether you're brewing the perfect cup of pour over, crack and open a can of 300 on your next backcountry mission, hoo boy! Black Rival Coffee is here to fuel your way, keep you upright in your seat, whatever it takes, wherever the summer takes you. So head to blackriflecoffee.com slash DanaTV to order yours. Use code DanaTV at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Fuel your summer with America's coffee, Black Rifle Coffee. So a little earlier, President Biden announced his new plan to crack down on guns because that's going to solve all the crime. But there's some other stuff incorporated into that, and we wanted to take a deeper dive with the National Shooting Sports Foundation's Matt Manda to break down what this means. Matt handles public policy over at NSSF. Matt, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Firearms and uh, what the president is uh, talking about and misleading about. Yeah, well, and that's the that's the thing. So uh, my there's there's two things that really strike me as super interesting. I mean, obviously, we knew he was going to go after ghost guns, which I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he really thought that they were just apparition firearms. But no one ever apparently acknowledges, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, Undetectable Firearms Act of 1988. I mean, all of this stuff is already a law. The thing, though, that really, really concerns me uh, and I know that you and Larry Keene and others at NSSF have talked about is the, is I like just PLACA, it's the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act. And this, it, it's kind of like a two-prong approach that they've tried to go after firearm manufacturers through this act. And so for those watching Matt and I just talk about this and who are unaware, they previously have tried to go after gun manufacturers by saying it was like false advertising or that they were, uh, or that they were uh, essentially making a, uh, poorly made product and they were trying to go after it for like a liability purpose. Neither of these make sense. But Matt, I'll ask you this, and I'm sure this is this is why you know he was relying upon his wingman Merrick Garland. But I mean, is there really are would they honestly be able to redefine legal terms in order to pass something like this on firearms manufacturers or repeal it? Yeah, well we are watching intently uh, to see what happens here, but it continues to go down this road. We saw a couple of months ago from the Rose Guard announcement on executive actions. Uh, afterwards, uh, the president was called out by uh, media, watched, uh, Washington Post, uh, PolitiFact, even CNN calling his claims about the PLCAA uh, false. Uh, the firearm industry does not have blanket immunity. Uh, it does not have special protections when um, third parties commit crimes using lawfully sold products. Um, there was quite a bit of pushback there. So now it's been a couple of months and this is still being rolled out. Um, the, you know, uh, Americans across the country, overwhelmingly millions, record numbers last year and the pace is continuing, are taking the second minute into their own hands uh, by purchasing firearms legally uh, at their retailer that is in, uh, uh, in their community, the best line of defense against these illegal straw purchases. Um, but those uh, 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 folks are relying on the lawful commerce of firearms, and the president going after the PLCAA is really an unserious solution to a very serious problem we're seeing across the country with this spike in criminal misuse of firearms and violence. Yeah, I, I, to, to illustrate this on radio earlier, Matt, you can tell me if this is a completely ridiculous, you know, a, analogy. But I just think that, you know, the firearm is the variable in this equation. I mean, ultimately, this could actually, if something like this were to be established, I mean, this, I, I don't see what sort of legal boundary could be uh, erected to, to stop this from affecting every single aspect of commercial industry, you know, no matter what the product is. Like, for instance, you know, knives. And I love the phrase that they used, not really love, but where they said crime gun by the way, when they were talking about this in their plan, like there's a whole separate section of crime guns at Walmart or something, or your FFL, where you, these are our regular legal guns and these are the crime guns that are for criminals. None, that's not how that works. But for the variable, it's like if there was a knife manufacturer and, and someone wanted to sue the knife manufacturer 
for a criminal taking that knife and stabbing someone to death, and they were trying to use the argument that th it was the knife, the product that was manufactured poorly, and as a result, they are liable for any injury that came from a defective product. That's the legal argument that they're trying to use. I can imagine, you know, even worst case scenario, Matt, something like that even standing up to legal scrutiny when it would be absolutely challenged. Absolutely, and a, a, a common uh, that we use, um, it would be somebody suing Ford for uh, as a victim of a drunk driving incident. I mean, that is just um, absurd. And, and that's why there are legal protections for companies when criminals or um, lawfully sold products are used the wrong way. Uh, and it's funny, it's funny you mentioned knives. Um, as we know, the uh, president and gun control advocates uh, continue to go on after uh, modern sporting rifles, a semi-automatic rifle that is the most popular selling um, firearm in the country for uh, rifle in the country, uh, combine the uh, fatalities um, from rifles, all of rifles, is far less than knives, hands, and clubs uh, uh, mm -hmm. from previous years. So this is a um, this is just not a serious solution, like I said earlier, to a very serious problem. Americans across the country. Uh, record numbers from across demographics. It is not just old white men who are stockpiling firearms. This is African Americans buying 60% more firearms than they did the year before. This is 42% of Asian Americans. This is 40% of Hispanics over the last year are buying firearms. This is people across the country. Women, 40% are buying firearms. They are taking uh, their Second Amendment right into their own hand. Uh, and firearm retailers in their communities are um, lines out the door for safety courses, for training courses, for practice ranges. And again, these proposals coming from the White House and from uh, gun control mm -hmm. advocates uh, in Congress, both the House and Senate, are not serious about addressing the very real problems of crime and criminal misuse of firearms across the country. No, you're absolutely right. Talking to Matt Mando with NSSF. Matt, you mentioned to the people who are purchasing firearms, right on cue, now, the day that the president's going to be coming out and, and pushing this, these new gun control measures, this like five-pronged uh, approach to this, you saw Associated Press, Time Magazine, a whole litany of, of uh, legacy media outfits that were all approaching uh, background checks the same way. They were saying, oh my goodness, with all of these new purchases, because that's been a pretty strong talking point. I mean, if, if legally owned and legally purchased firearms, if the increase in this is somehow in any way related to crime, then why doesn't the crime match the record number of sales? I think your your organization had it like one and a half to two million firearms or, or two million, I think, background checks per month. So they were saying that the initial denials, uh, for instance, for one month were 300,000 denials. Can you believe that? Now, for the people who don't understand that, I mean, sure, I'm, I would imagine that when you have a record number every month of people purchasing firearms, you would see initial denials of 4473s. But Matt, what they don't include and what time the AP didn't include and obviously what President Biden didn't include either is the fact that so many of these are initial denials because social security numbers are not required with 4473s. So you have a lot of false positives. That's always revised down and it's usually to like double digits at that time and then of that too few are even prosecuted not mentioned anywhere in any media article about this at all but it's a huge talking point now your thoughts yeah exactly i spoke with a uh, local tv station yesterday in florida about this very point and um what we want as an industry is law law-abiding americans to be able to purchase firearms we've seen over the last 18 months those are record numbers uh, from 2015 to 2019, the denial percentage was uh, between 0 0.04, 0 0.03, less than one half of 1%. Uh, and with the AP News story that came out, I don't believe that those are final numbers that, uh, like you said, there's some context and there's some siphoning out of uh, filtering of what actually will be a, um, uh, a denial that comes out. But I think the numbers that they're citing is 300,000. Even if that mm. is the case, that is still less than uh, one one percent on 23 million background checks around last year. That pace is continuing this year. And again, I, I heard uh, former Congressman uh, Cedric Rich Richmond talk to uh, Casey Hunt, I believe, on MSNBC, talking about how for far too long the gun industry has been running the show. And that is why we are experiencing a dramatic increase in crime across the country. And I would just uh, say, I think at the time, uh, Congressman Richmond then was uh, in, uh, came into office in Congress in 2011. Now, President Biden, then Vice President Biden and President Obama 
had the White House between 20, uh, 2009 and 2011 with a Democrat-controlled Senate and House, mm. there was not much done. This is not about who is in charge or what is in charge. This is about Americans taking the Second Amendment into their hand, and they're overwhelmingly voting at their uh, community-based retail outlet. It's hard to keep a uh, product in the store because they are lawfully buying mm. firearms. They are concerned about community safety when you hear calls for defunding the police and uh, law enforcement uh, retiring. Uh, it is hard um, to ensure uh, Americans that they are going to be safe unless they have a firearm yeah. in their hand. First time, eight and a half million first time buyers last year. People are taking this very seriously and they're taking it in their own hands. To, to that point, we're talking again with Matt Mando with NSSF. I would say it is to a certain extent about who is in charge. When you look at the number of cities uh, where that are tops on the list of violent crime. And interestingly enough, it's those same cities that rank highest for violent crime that are also lowest for prosecutions, repeat offenders for illegally carried firearms used in, in felonies, Matt. Uh, that I don't I didn't see that addressed either in, in the uh, Biden gun control. We hate guns and eagles and American pie and whatever, uh, apple pie and American flags, whatever. Didn't see that in the plan. Uh, yeah, and again, uh, very timely bringing that up. We were in Chicago just last week uh, the NSSF president and CEO, Joe Bartosi, was uh, speaking at a local retailer in the Chicago area. There are no FFLs in Chicago, but just in the displays. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were speaking about the, the, the very um, important and significant partnership we have with ATF and DOJ. Don't lie for the other guy to reduce illegal straw purchases. And uh, we've seen that these efforts are really impactful and, and having a, um, a positive effect on reducing um, unintentional firearm deaths and fatalities across the country. I think uh, efforts that we have uh, partnered with local law enforcement, 40 million gun safety kits, including trigger locks for our Project Child Safe, uh, reducing at home and safe storage uh, accidents and don't lie to reduce straw purchases. These are the lowest numbers of unintentional firearm fatalities um, in over 100 years. I believe it's since 1903, since data was uh, mm -hmm. first collected on this. And you're seeing in cities that have the most strict gun control, like Chicago, you are seeing criminals who are not obeying laws, who are not going to pay attention to a um, repeal of the PLCAA, who are not going to pay attention to illegal straw purchases. They're going to continue to get their firearms illegally. Uh, these are not serious solutions to a very serious problem. And until uh, uh, they approach this in a very serious way, I suppose you will still see some of these issues and Americans will still take the Second Amendment into their own hand. There you go. Last question for you, Matt. The uh, Senate, all of this, uh, obviously, if it can't be done by executive order, it's going to have to go through Congress, which he still calls on Congress to do a number of things. But it definitely, when he doesn't spell it out that, that it is executive order, you definitely get the sense that it's going to be. Uh, but going through the Senate, I mean, it'll make, it'll make it through the House right now before 2022, maybe. But going through the Senate, you're looking at Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema and a few other senators. The Joe Manchin vote is incredibly interesting. He's always been a little bit unpredictable on issues like this. He's not as, as stalwart about Second Amendment rights as we are. But where do you see him falling uh, on the line with, with some of these proposals that are coming up if they do in, you know, turn into legislation that he has to vote on? Well, it's a great point. And you brought up uh, s some of these um, gun control bills have already passed through the House. Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has the thinnest margin uh, that she can afford uh, to lose any Democrats on. Uh, those bills are stalling in the Senate. And what you're seeing is senators are, you know, they're paying attention to what they're hearing and polling Gallup, Washington Post, Ipsos, ABC shows support for gun control is lower than it has been in several years, uh, even among self-described Democrats. I believe that uh, that polling is about five to 10% less on who supports more strict gun control. So some of these uh, senators that you're seeing, maybe Joe Manchin, maybe John Tester, maybe um, mm -hmm. Angus King up in some of these other places you've seen in similar states, the other senator, um, Senator Steve Daines, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, uh, Senator Susan Collins have come up, come out against the ATF uh, nominee. They are not supportive of more gun control. They see what is going on across the country. These uh, Americans who are lawfully buying firearms are in those suburbs. They're in the swing districts that have seen community violence across the last year. They are paying attention. This is uh, gonna be something to watch. It is critically important right now as the nominee is out there, as this gun control legislation uh, is in the Senate. 
You've seen some states where, uh, like Florida, where state level policies have died. They've seen that, yeah. uh, that uh, there was not support there. Sessions ended with gun control bills not going anywhere. So they're paying attention. Good. It's good to see that, too. Yeah, and also considering West Virginia, Mansion State going by Trump, plus 38. Strong 2A folks there. Matt, good to see you. Matt Manda, NSSF. Always a pleasure. And we'll, we'll watch and see what happens uh, with this proposal. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dana. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Another cyber hack just a day after Biden's summit with Putin. We'll talk to Rebecca Heinrich, senior fellow at Hudson Institute, about that. Keep it here. First, the Colonial Pipeline hack, then the hacking of America's largest meat producer. One day after the summit with Vladimir Putin, another hack, this time a Georgia hospital system. Actually, it was like the largest hospital in the state of Georgia. Rebecca Heinrich is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. She's been following this and joins us to discuss it. Rebecca, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to see you, Dana. Thanks for having me. Of course, always, uh, and, and enjoy your work on this issue. This, um, I, I mean, really, I, I know every administration goes into some kind of meeting with, you know, Putin now, because apparently it's going to be Vladimir Putin forever now, uh, goes into a meeting with Russia, you know, some of these other foreign dignitaries at these G7 summits, and it's really optics. I mean, we know that nothing important is going to happen while the cameras are rolling. But it is really, really weird how, you know, you have Joe Biden show up, they have this discussion, and then the day after, uh, you know, uh, here we have another uh, ransomware hacking. The excuse that I heard, Rebecca, and I heard this with Colonial, is that, well, it's some Russians, but it's not Kremlin affiliated. It's just some Russians that have done like Colonial. It's just some Russians where they think it's some other, an, another criminal Russian outfit. Is, that doesn't seem realistic. And how naive is that? Do you think it's naive? Do you think I'm wrong thinking that everything probably goes through Kremlin and there's nothing that these people are doing that Putin's not aware of? Exactly right. It's an authoritarian country. Putin knows what's going on. The only way this could happen is that if there's at least tacit approval from the Russian government. But when you're talking about major supply chains in the United States, that almost certainly is coming directly from the Russian government. Now, you haven't seen the U.S. intelligence agency directly tie the Russian government uh, or the intelligence community tie them directly together because then you're going to have require the U.S. government to have some kind of retaliatory response that's public against the Russian government, lest they be called completely weak against Russia. However, you did hear President Biden make cybersecurity a big deal. And he had this bizarre comment that he made after he came out of the meeting with Putin, where he said he handed Putin a list where he said, I think there was like 16 things that I said, but I don't want you to attack with cyber attack. Which um, I, when I heard that, I thought there's no way his staff wanted him to say publicly that he had given Vladimir Putin this list. But in doing so, he's essentially, I mean, he is saying that he knows that the Russian government um, has the ability to at least stop these attacks. But he's also saying, listen, don't attack these. These are our most important things we don't want you to attack, to attack. But if you attack all these other things, you're not going to suffer the same kind of consequences. The exact kind of thing you don't want to be telegraphing to Vladimir Putin because you could unintentionally incentivize him to continue attacking these other things without consequence. So it's no surprise that there's another attack right after the meeting. I assume that this Georgia hospital was not on the list of those 16 things that, that uh, President Biden gave to Vladimir Putin. It, it, I, and I remember one of the uh, one of the discussions about this when the press was saying uh, asking about the nature of the talks and there was something where he had said and I think this was when he was in the full sun press conference after Putin's was inside insanely and Biden they decided to put him outside this elderly gentleman in full sun uh, with no shade and try to talk for a couple hours but he had said well I told him you know to stop any or to not have any kind of cyber aggression which that it almost seemed it seemed weak it seemed like you were you were trying to negotiate from a position of weakness, which that has never been, at least, you know, when you look at Reagan or, or even W and, and under Trump, that's never, it's never been the best place to negotiate from. It's always a position of strength. That seemed like a giant troll. What can we expect, do you think? Are we going to see more aggression in terms of cyber warfare from, from Russia? And should I go ahead and buy gas in bulk? Yeah, um, I, I would say that the Russians are definitely not deterred by whatever President Biden said in that meeting nor do I think that they could be. Um, 
You make a great point about from a position of strength. One of the things that I, I wrote this article for the Washington Examiner, um, where I say that, you know, for all of the Russia, Russia, Russia we heard during the Trump administration, we we really saw some tough policies towards Russia coming out of the Trump administration over the four years. They opposed the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. That's that big energy pipeline of natural gas that would go flow from Russia to Germany. The many um, of the uh, EU states opposed it. NATO allies opposed it because it would enable Russia to extort them. And so it weakens mm. um, NATO and it doesn't help unify NATO. The Germans love it, of course, especially the corrupt elite Germans who, who go then retire and go make a buck off of Russian energy. Um, the Trump administration opposed it. Congress, and from a bipartisan fashion, opposed it, had sanctions opposing it. And the Biden administration comes in, says that they oppose it. But then President Biden uh, waves sanctions against one of Putin's cronies um, and another entity going into this meeting with Vladimir Putin. That is by, I mean, that is a position of weakness. When you're already capitulating, making concessions, going into a summit, you're saying, listen, I'm going to walk back. I haven't even gotten anything for this yet, but I'm willing to, you know, bend you know, bend down and do the things that you that you want me to do um, and hand you these things and, and walk them back for nothing. Um, and so yeah. he's not telegraphing that he's coming from a position of strength. And so I wouldn't expect that Vladimir Putin would take him seriously. Yeah, and in and, and your piece, by the way, and talking to Rebecca Heinrichs here with the Hudson Institute and Washington Examiner was great. A lot of things to be concerned about. You brought up the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Previously, Ukraine had this status as, as this transit country. They had that protection of having the original pipeline, which I think Russia was engaging in this misinformation campaign and saying, oh, it's an old crusty pipeline. It's super dangerous. Let's not use it. Now they're, they're bypassing Ukraine, really destabilizing, I think, Germany's position as a NATO member, as you mentioned. That, I mean, they can extort them now. I mean, and Angela Merkel or whoever wins in these elections, they're not going to—they're not going to be able to stand up to Russia if they turn off everybody's heat in the middle of in the middle of winter. But the buildup that was along the border there, and I know them wanting to be able to have that deep water port and to really be able to control all of the traffic in the Black Sea and then have easy access really to the Mediterranean. When this pipeline is completed, and I think it was something like over 95 percent or something like that now. What do you anticipate that we're going to see from Russia, if not towards Ukraine, but in the Black Sea, you know, at large, after the completion of that pipeline? That was the big gift that Biden that Biden gave Putin with that green light. That's exactly right. And one of the things the Biden administration says is, well, listen, it was 95 percent completed. So, you know, there's nothing we can do. But a 95 com you know, percent completed pipeline is still a pipeline that doesn't work. Um, and so you need it to be 100 percent. So they could have continued to exert pressure. And he could have, by the way, not just pressure that he could have continued to put on Putin and the Russians, uh, President Biden could have and should have um, continued using leverage that was built up during the, the Trump administration to pressure Germany to go a different direction. I mean, it's like the Biden administration thinks that if a, if a country is an ally, therefore we are aligned in every manner and facet. And with the Germans, we know it's not. We know it's not true versus Russia. We know it's not true versus China. And so even allies need pressure sometimes. Now, he doesn't have to take the same approach. He's a different man than, than President Trump, and so he can take a more positive, you know, rhetorical approach towards the Germans publicly, but privately, he should have been pressuring the Germans. So I would expect the Russians to do what they say they're going to do. They've already threatened to turn off the energy to Ukraine um, if they don't behave themselves according to what the Russians want. And so they're already using this pipeline to um, extort Ukraine, but it's not just Ukraine, it's the Poles, of course, that are very concerned about this. They lose a lot of um, money by this pipeline, but they also then are at the whims and the mercy of, of the Russians as they use energy to, to extort Eastern and Central Europe while they treat the Western Europeans, the rich countries, so much better. So it's terrible. It's terrible for NATO. Um, and, and, you know, you don't even hear the press cover. You always hear the, the press say, look, our, our allies are so happy that that the, that the Biden administration is in office now, and they never mention the fact that we've got great dollar allies in the polls, for instance, who are really um, having a hard time um, already the short time the Biden administration has been in office. Boy, oh boy, what a mess, an absolute mess over there. Rebecca Heinrichs at the Hudson Institute. Thank you so much for, for your work on this and for joining me here on this today. I'm sure we're gonna have more things to talk about in the future. We'd love to have you back. Thank you. I would love to come back. Thank you, Dana. Of course. Coming up, the war on all things normal continues. Keep it here.
Well, for a while now, Victoria's Secret sales have been on the decline. And rather than get to the bottom of why, Victoria's Secret decided that it would go completely broke by going woke. How? They're going to ditch the angels, those super long-waisted and possibly slender models with fake wings, and trading them all in for an all-star lineup of very diverse individuals, which should be like caps lock with a trademark. It's almost like woke hates beauty. It's all part of this like great flattening of beauty done in the name of quote unquote diversity and quote unquote inclusiveness by Woke Inc. I'm totally gonna trademark Woke Inc. After all, our new goal should be equity, we're told, and everyone should be supposedly regarded as equally beautiful. But not everyone is equally fast or equally tall or equally smart, yet we celebrate standouts in those categories. Why can't we celebrate standouts in beauty? I mean, in any case, it seems now Victoria's Secret has caught this diversity, equity, inclusivity bug and removed one thing from their brand that actually made people look at their, like, their panties and jammies, angels in lingerie. But will it work? I mean, ask yourself, if you're a dude, do you, you want to look at a dude who, who says, identifies as a woman, or would you just rather look at a woman? Because you're going to get that for your lady, right? Or if you're a girl, honestly, if you're looking at stuff you want to look at how it fits on another woman, or you want to look at a more attractive woman and pretend that's how it'll look on you. That's how sales works, right? Oh, apparently it makes you a giant bigot for asking this question, like transphobic or sexist or bigoted, I don't know. I mean, we used to accept that people had a type, like, right, maybe your type as a dude is the opposite sex, and last time we checked, that doesn't make you a bad person, except society says it does now. It makes you a heterosexual, but society says that that means you're just bigoted. What? One of the new models, by the way, for this is Megan Rapinoe. She is going to host some kind of podcast or something, not walking around in lingerie. I'm not going to tune into any of that because, no, I'd rather jump off my roof and break my legs down to nubbins. Uh, I'm not looking at Megan Rapinoe as a Victoria's Secrets model. I'm not looking to her for fashion ideas. I'm not looking at her for any latest thoughts on how tough it is to be a famous female soccer player and have all these multi-million dollar endorsements. But, you know, apparently you don't get paid as much as the guys, even though a high school guys team in Texas beat you during a scrimmage. But okay. No, they'll now also feature a plus size model, which is, I don't, there's plus size, by the way, and then there's also morbidly obese. And I cannot stand that our society conflates the two. So let's make that, let the nuance exists here. So, you know, skinny isn't the only female form that can be beautiful. I mean, I think we all agree that, right? And so do plenty of dudes. Since when is that news, though? Notions of beauty change over time. And there's actual explanations to that, right? Beauty is subjective. And a lot of things like economic stability plays into it. There's all kinds of definitions of beauty, blah, blah, blah. But Victoria's Secret had a specific brand and an image and it worked for them pretty well, even if their super over padded bras didn't. Sure, the angels were very beautiful and super long waisted and unattainable for the average person. But we do aspire and celebrate outstanding beauty as humans, and I fail to see the problem with that. And there was nothing wrong with having a brand like Victoria's Secret that celebrated a particular view on beauty, a view that millions of men and women appreciated. Any other fashion brand is totally free to take a different tact and celebrate any other form of beauty in any way they want to. But just stop acting like if someone doesn't choose your choice that they're bigoted for not choosing your choice because they're not bigoted for not choosing your choice any more than you're not bigoted for not choosing their choice. And so Victoria's Secret, if they so choose, they can do what they want. That's the beauty of the free market system here in America. But ultimately, it's that very market that will determine if Victoria's Secret's new approach is appealing to consumers. We'll find out. One thing for sure, sales numbers don't lie. You can't keep that a secret. That does it for us tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Good night, and don't bend the knee.